Street Culture TV. No respect, no. <laughs> Fast style, what's going on? All right, Tracy 168. Introduce yourself. How you doing? I'm Tracy 168, Wild Style. Wanted president, Bronx, Brooklyn, my whole city. First whole city writer ever. Hello, testing, how great I am. All right. No, it just, it was like more or less. Okay, here we go. It was a Tom Sawyer thing. It was, what happened was, after like we did, found the tagging thing, now it was on. I, li I went to school with like um, Clyde in script. Chichi 133, Santos 108, FJCRC, the first guy that ever died in graffiti, was my partner. I lost a lot of friends. This is the only thing about this art form that's not like nothing uh, you ever existed in the art world. If you get killed, you don't get your life back. This ain't no Nintendo game, motherfucker. This is real life. You die, it's over, goodbye. And I didn't know that this art form was so crazy like that, that when I actually lost a friend of mine, which I'm gonna go right into, I thought it was just a dream. Like I thought he, I would see him again. RC fell off the back of a train with FJC, I mean with uh, MG1, and broke his neck and MG rolled down the tracks and went into a coma. Now I thought I would see this guy again and I never seen him again. He was only 11 years old. He never lived life, that's graffiti. This is the first art form done on trains that kicked ass. I happened to be part of that shit, which is pretty cool. Um, never done before. Whenever they describe it like the catacombs and this shit and that shit from this, it's all fucking bullshit. There's no trains involved. There's 600 volts of electricity. You got the third rail, you're walking on layups that you're like three or four stories off the ground, man, with boards that look like they've been rotted for a million years. The termite would wave to your ass. And I'm like, whoa, if I fall through that shit, if I don't die from that, the third rail will kill me. Or the train to go by, which is tons of, hundred tons of train, just f whatever's left of me would be a motherfucker. So you got all this extra adrenaline shit going on besides trying to create shit on the train and learn at the same time not to touch certain things. You know how you learn? You hope somebody else touches it first. That's the fucking real answer. And you don't do that shit ever again. In the beginning, we started tagging, right? And it was an early thing. We come from the area of Yankee Stadium, the Bronx. This is where the hip hop thing actually started. But there wasn't hip hop yet. This is a word that came after us. So I'm earlier than hip hop. Hip hop bullshit. All that shit, all the names that you hear, what they're called, is the media calling it. I'm, where, I'm before the word graffiti. I mean, I'm not a graffiti artist. I'm a writer, man. I've always been a writer. That's what we were called. We call each other, what you write? What you write? What do you write? We're writers. They called us graffiti artists because they knocked it. This is my buddy Tacky. They said that he was the first graffiti writer. Now, the reason why they called him, now look at the fucking name, Tacky. I mean, what another attack on the name. That's it's Tacky. Get that shit off the train. But the name is a Greek name. Demetrius is a good friend of mine. He's still writing. Met much love to him and shit. He's uh, one of the innovators of the whole art form. Early tags. There was a lot of tags on stations. We didn't really reach the trains until a little later. When the trains started, we started hitting the trains. The main thing we used to hit was between the cars. So when you watched the trains, you had to try to make your name. We would spray and we'd see like, a handful of names would pop up after a while, like he was, he was telling, like Lee 163, super cool. Like later on, you start seeing these tags. I'm like, whoa, this is good. Joe 182, you know, that's Broadway, and Brooklyn, Fuzz, and Spin, but that was a little later, but I watched the whole shit grow from all the boroughs, and who's who, and what's what. Barbara and Eva, they first people to tag. Line 0160, which I have much respect, because he invented the knock your ass out for a can of spray paint, which is the Bogart and shit. Walk in, take shit, fuck you, Bogart. He invented that, I give him love too, Line 0168. But, um, the early tags, what we used to do, we used to tag in between the cars. And hopefully your name would lead the train. To lead the train means you made it. That's like a fucking piece. That was, and your tag had to be very important. Your tag was your signature was fucking you. Your tag had to be so fucking you. You had to practice it, make sure that it represented who you were. And the arrow, you had to throw an arrow on your name because arrows came out. Like about 71 arrows were important, so everybody had to put an arrow on the name. So you don't know where to put it if you didn't have a brain. The S, stay high, put his on the S. I put mine on the Y. Luckily, I had a spot that had an N. <coughs> I'm running all over the place because I have a million. But the tag was very important, and then the tag got to be placed somewhere that it fitted perfectly into a spot. So, like I said, the train, if your name led the train, 
you was the man. And we, we, we were standing on the train station literally like this. Like looking between the fucking, it looked like a tennis match, man. It was bug. But we're watching in between, got it. Famous, 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 a little like that. Just goofing and shit. And all we did was snap and rap and bullshit. And it was all the cultures. The best thing about this whole art form is every, every culture in the whole world was there. And you realize prejudice is a lot of shit. And all those lines that they draw when you grow up and say stay away from that person, it's all fake. Every culture and every person that I ever met in my life, I learned to love. The only thing that they teach you how not to love people, because fear sells. And fuck them. This is the best art form, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And I thought it was the greatest thing to be with all these people that I wrote with. Every culture all over the fucking world is great. And I love it to death. It was like, but then you got to get used to eating their food. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Not just, oh, it, it happened so fast. It was like a bugged out thing. See, graffiti grew quick. Um, the reason for that is because it was always one guy trying to outdo you, which is good. The competition shit was quick. And everybody always said it was a lot easier to write back in the day. I want to cure something right now. That's a lot of fucking shit. I read some books like Marty Cooper. You're an asshole, bitch. Sorry. I mean, I'm reading shit like about the, the, all that shit about it's easier. It was harder. They didn't even know what graffiti was. You write on a man's house that he paid $100,000 for, he's going to put a bullet in your fucking head. It wasn't like you think it is. I mean, today everybody knows what graffiti was. They don't kill you for writing on their car or writing on a, a building that they own. Before they go, what the fuck are you, crazy? You're writing on my building? They put a bullet in your head. And you had, I had fights with people that it was mad fist fights. I mean, one guy smacked me in my fucking face, man. He said, you wrote on my bill, smacked me. And I said, I'll be back. I had a fight like major motherfuckers behind this shit. It wasn't no joke. There's, when you hear stories from some of these guys, that they don't have a clue what the fuck they're talking about. I know what the fuck it was because I, I lived through it. I've seen it. I fought whole neighborhoods that I had to crawl on my fucking ass to get out of the block. Because you couldn't get a motherfucker when they're on the floor. It's almost like a wrestling thing, you know? But I fucking punched this dude in his face. I broke his whole fucking face. But then to get out of there, I had to crawl on my ass two blocks. Try that shit sometimes. But I got away to come back again. That's why I'm still here even now. How am I doing? So, but it's, I mean, dangerous. Are you right in the wrong neighborhood? That turfs. You go into different areas. Gangs were tough. Gangs are real big in New York City then. So if you walk one block, you're in a black area. You walk, all of a sudden, it's time to fight for that just alone. Fuck the graffiti part. You had to know what you're doing and how to, how to run fast. Run, rack it up. These are the major essentials for a graffiti writer. Run, steal, run, <laughs> rack up, run. Nah. Fight and run. And you know what you're doing. And I mean, really move and paint and use your brains when you're tagging, man, because you can fuck up one move and you're over. You get hurt real bad. Okay, what happened was real fast, when we were leaving like the in-between car tags, we tried this new shit. On our way out, we would tag our names on the outside. We knew it would blow up the area because the conductor would drive by and see your name and they'd call the police right away. But that's our last tag before we left and to see if it lasted. That's the next move. That's how the pieces started. And we saw it and the next thing you know, we said, oh shit, they left it. Once they left it on the outside, on the outside, and then they clean it, the rest is fucking history. Now it's just to make it bigger. The only difference is we take one whole one whole spray can was like about 60 tags. Now you're, yet, you're taking one fucking can and you're doing your whole name. Now you need an outline, you need two cans. Whoa, that's work. Now I gotta steal two cans and shit. But you were like, what well, you started to do, because there was no fucking like blueprints and there was no writers yet. It was trial and error. A lot of the mistakes were the best pieces that ever existed, by the way. And you just go, oh shit, look what you did. I go, I know, that's what I meant to do. That's most of the writers who did. It was all mistake, trial and error. So like what we do real big, you like do a giant tag and your covers, you walk across the whole train as big as you can and you just start building it. You make it thicker and thicker. It's almost like building on clay, like Quincy shit, you know, those clay shits. You start making it fatter and fatter and then when you feel like it looks even, everything looked kind of even, you'll go right into like the outline which was kind of like skimpy, but it was good. And then you felt real cool, like that shit is bad. 
because there ain't nothing like it anyway. You're still going, oh shit, and it's ugly as hell, but you're going, look at that motherfucker. Then you're like, let me see what I can put in this. And you're going, because we're growing up, we were brought up by TV. So TV taught us every shit. Like we're like, we had like the Man From Uncle, the Time Tunnel. We had all this weird shit going on. Stars, stripes, cartoons, bull bubbles. Everything was from, remember, we came from the 60s. All that shit was like peace, love, rock and roll, those sides of vans, like the Partridge Family shit. So colors, a lot of colors. So we just took colors and then you just stars in it and arrows, whatever you could come up with and shit to make your name jump out more than the next guy. It was still a competition thing. A little bit more colors, a little bit of thing. Um, and that was beautiful. Then you walk away and you go, look at that shit. I wasted two cans on that. And that was like a lot. Then the next guy did two cans and then it's five cans. Then as fast as, I say in six months, that shit escalated to three dimensionals, fucking flames, clouds, big hole fucking under the windows to top to bottom, starting kicking real fast. 3D shadows, shadow, flame, first flame, first shadow. But the whole idea is to get something to make your name show. Years ago, then they had this one guy, two guys, that they tagged a face. Because the Jackson 5 round, I think they did like the black face with the afros to the side. I think it might have been Fuzz from Brooklyn. First graffiti with Stop 700. <clears throat> now, I'm, I don't have an afro. I don't know if you know that. I don't have a fucking hair holy anymore. But I had like a nice hair, like um, John Travolta kind of thing going on. And I wanted to draw my face forward. So I created this face with glasses that most of you guys know what it is. Everybody in that motherfucker tries it. I know if you're a writer. I made glasses, but I made a front profile of, of a kid, but I made him with straight hair. And people went, what the fuck is that? And I inf incorporated it into my name. And I started using cartoons, like a motherfucker. I'm one of the first writers to use cartoons in full color ever. And I, pr I did it as a goof once, just to show FJC I could paint anything, which was jo Sergeant Snorkel. And I used it on the train, forget it. After that, I ran the fucking subways. There wasn't nothing out there that I had to kick ass. There was a lot of li like lettering things, like phase, you had phase, let me see who else got up in letter. Hondo kicked ass, super cool, because the fact that his name was so damn long, stay high, because the stick man made it like interesting, because we had the saint. There were certain names that like stood out. Everything else was just fucking floaters. To me, it was just fucking wait, like just fillers. Something to fucking go up there and kick their ass, which is good. I go up there, the first thing I do is I walk the whole layup and I look at all, all the pieces and see what they hit, like, what, what was the best thing on the layup. And I would go there and burn the fuck out of them. And I would go up there with like a handful of humans. You always had like a stunt man to help you. We call them like uh, toys, they call them, but there was, they were actually very important. A toy was the most important writer, really. He's the guy you left behind to get busted. He's the one that carried your paint. I mean, he was important, like a motherfucker. He's the guy on Star Trek, you send them to the ground and he never comes back to test the soil. <laughs> you need that motherfucker. So, um, like, we'll start doing the burners, and the, my main thing was to I look at all the pieces, and I incorporate it, and then I burn. And I won't leave the layup until I kick that fucking guy's ass. And I wrote with some of the best writers ever, from Pro Soul 165, even FaZe, I wrote with Lee, um, El Marco 174, Chris and Bonanza, I started those guys. I started a lot of the major writers, man. Um, the guys, Bobby 172, Santos, like a Chichi, like I said, Sonny 107. These guys don't even, they're never mentioned. They're masters. You got Mitch 77, that's one of my kids. I taught T Kid, I showed fucking uh, Nomad. I showed people over the years, so many people. You name them, I, I taught them, I showed them something. I was always an artist. You could be a, a fucking writer, but I could draw. So I'm fucking advanced. I could draw you. I mean, that's right there. If I, if I felt like I was losing in graffiti, I'll burn you by drawing your picture next to it. I'll do something they say, whoa, fuck me up. And I have imagination that's off the hook. I know you know that now. Uh -huh. I could come up with shit fucking like fucking, like these stories you hear from other writers, but I could give you some real whop. First of all, we'll go back about to 73, 74. I was the vice president of war. Writers already respected. I was on Ex Vandals, which is pretty wild, because what I hear now, I don't even know what the fuck half these people are saying. The history's a little, these books kind of fuck the history up. 
I think they took a lot of the shit. It's like me writing about race cars and never wrote driver. I don't even have a driver's license. These motherfuckers are discussing graffiti and never wrote it. A lot of writers, you know, if you needed to hear the truth, you go to a writer to ask about graffiti. You go to a guy that races cars about racing cars. You don't talk to me about racing fucking cars. One thing about, I didn't know, half these books that are written are by, by non-writing motherfuckers. They act like they discovered America. It's like when they got here and they said they discovered America. There was people standing on the shore, motherfucker. How are you going to discover something already with people on it, dickheads? I can't deal with that shit. And then they said, look what I found. They were savages until I taught them how, what they were doing. We invented this art form. This art form was invented by me, which is fucking weird as hell. I never thought in my wildest I'd be in fucking London right now discussing this shit. This is the greatest thing in the world, man. It's great. Uh, this is fucking, it, it blew up so much. It's the whole world. I get letters all my life from everywhere in the world. It's, I love it to death, and I think it's, it's, it's growing. I found Europe really went off the deep end. I, I appreciated Europe a lot. A lot of people were very jealous of Europe when it started kicking here a lot because um, they were jealous because the styles were, you guys reminded me of the 70s, and it was still a life. It was new. It was fucking brand new like a baby boy, a baby birth, a birth. You guys kept that, and it got sour where we live. People started getting stagnated, comfortable. Sometimes you got to kid something to keep an edge. Do something. That's why I kept feeding them new shit. Which I, I used to be the president of Wanted, which was all the writers in New York City. I got the best writers I've ever. FDT, Clyde, fucking um, LSD3, Cliff 159. I took all the Checker 170, Sunny 107. I could go on and on. And I made the biggest group. I had like 80 members. A white guy I took over a black uh, a gang, the Savage Skulls gang and just put my crew in there, fuck them, and made the biggest graffiti group ever. Then I took that, and like I said, CIA and the CIA, I took the best of the writers. I created a thing called Wild Style, because the way I live, I live like nobody else. I live wild, untamed, don't tell me how to live unless you're ready to die for me. And with style, I have class, I was brought up with class and morals. You know, you're supposed to respect everybody and give them that first. Give them what you want to give, you want to get, you give out to get it back. So wild style is, I'm untamed, I'm free, but I got style in class, so I won't hurt, I won't disrespect you, but that mix is pretty wild style. That's, that's what wild style is, and I made this group of the best fucking writers and thieves and everything. They, the best of what you do in your life is to be wild. I invented this crew of them, just the best. Even if you wasn't the best writer, you had the best imagination, you're in. Or you jumped with bikes, you're in. If you did skateboarding, you was the best, you're in. If you was a writer, you're in. If a cameraman, you're in. Anything that you was the best at, you was in Wild Star if you were the best. No second best. If you're not the best, find your act, look for it, become the best at what you do, then you're Wild Star. But Wild Star is who I am. It's just a way of thinking that I incorporate into a hopefully a world. I think it actually became like hip hop, that word. It should have been really called Wild Star because that's what this is. It's love. Love is the strongest element in our whole earth. That's the real deal. This is love. This is based on love, this art form. I like the media. The media, we need the media. Who else would be an asshole but the media? The media is going to be around way long. They're the devil's advocates. I love that shit. You gotta, first, they bring in this shit, and I tell the truth. You need somebody to tell you some shit so you can say, that's fake. It's all bullshit. You edit you, they edit what you say, they take it out of context. It's all bullshit. But you need that because that gives you like controversy. As far as hip hop, what they call hip hop, rap is really what it is. All the rappers wrote graffiti with me. Flash 191, Flash. Love Bug Starsky, Hero fucking Comet 1, not the other dummy. You have, um, but he also wrote too. You got to give him his props. Comet 1, they both of them got up. Um, you had fucking Cool Herc. He wrote Herc. Cool Herc on the trains, man. I knew Herc for years. These are where we all started. Graffiti's our first start. They didn't kick my ass in graffiti, so they went into... A lot of us used to write rap, like rhymes, too, because if you couldn't draw, you had to just rhyme. Because I could draw. They had to rhyme. They had to go, uh, who, um, take five claims, king of the six, but watch out for Kindle, who's full of tricks, shit like that, to make your name stand out. So rhymes were there, and we just put music behind that shit, and that's how that started. But 
It still came from the graffiti, and that's the root. Without graffiti, there's no nothing. This shit's just dead. This is, this is the root. This is wild. So I was with Cool Herc, hanging out with those guys at Grandmaster Kaz, which I give him much respect. He started, he wrote Rap is the Light. Gave it to Big Bag Hank. I mean, come on. It just, they, they switch it around. Sylvia Records comes in, steals it. Here's some dough money. Not like money to fucking break up a friendship, right? But that's good. You get rid of a guy for $10, you're lucky. He could get rid of you for fucking 100 So you get rid of the assholes, it's worth 10 bucks. As far as those guys, I love them. They're still around. I give them a lot of respect. They're still writers to me. They're just my partners in graffiti. And they just became rap. They're just doing rhymes and rap. And that's what they are. And they're godfathers of that shit, too. But as far as godfather, I started this whole shit, man. I'm one of the motherfucking originals. Get used to it. I got to be one of the top ten. Maybe the top eight. I say number one, motherfucker. And you can do it like this if you like. I don't give a fuck. The future's not... I only live for the present. There's no fucking future nowhere. There's the only thing that's real is reality is right now. I'm right here. This is where, they asked me where I live. I live in London. That's where I live. Wherever I breathe is where I'm at. That's where I'm living. I, I'm from right here. The only thing promised to you is today. That's why I call it a present. The present. The future's not promised to me. The past ain't nothing but a cancel fucking check. Live for today, because I buried everybody, so I don't, think, I don't think like that in terms of the future. Hopefully, the art form will keep going way, way after I'm gone. Hopefully, we will lose the truth, which is very important, because that keeps the, the root strong. If you get rid of the truth, you lose the root, you lose the root, you lose the thing, it could fall apart. The only way to take this shit down is infiltrate it and make lies out of it. That's why you got a lot of people infiltrating with a lot of dough. When Bill Gates got involved in it, I said, yo, what the fuck does he need to know about graffiti? Paul Allen, I'm sorry, Paul Allen. $23 billion guy, he needs to know about graffiti. Yes, yes, y'all, you lying fuck. I don't fuck with your shit with Microsoft. Don't fuck with graffiti. They give me much respect. They look at me like they can't. They, they get looked at and then they look at me like they're, looking, they're looked at. It's pretty wild. They look at me like a superstar as to other people looking at them. They get a chance to take a minute off and look. And I just, like I run into them, they look back at me, they go, that's that fucking Tracy. Yeah, that's me, man. I'm going to be around a long, long time. Word up. That's bad because I'm fucking cause. You know what I mean? Yeah. I want the cause to see this shit. That's pretty weird, I'm more famous than I am. I'm more famous than myself, that's what I always say. I'm bigger than I am. People don't even believe I'm me. I thought you were this, I thought you were that. You, whatever you thought, I don't give a shit. But that's okay too, because the thought only makes it real and it's a reality and, and it grew. It's big, it's big. And when you see stars stop and they go, I know I heard of you, it's pretty wild. Like Christopher Walken walked up to me and went, you Tracy? No way. I go, yes way. No way. The king of New York meets the king of New York. <laughs> I'm fucking around. <laughs> but that's no way. Yes way. You know, you know, fuck with the, the way they talk and give them back to themselves. I call that shit mirror reflections. Let me see. Well, running the, the main thing, like I said, the layups, we used to go there like, um, the first thing you had to do was try to figure out how to get away. 
whenever we painted on the layups, it was a very, it was only one way out, that station or this station. It was kind of dangerous. So one time I was getting chased by Hulk 62, Creeper, and I'm running and, and they're like, they caught me between the cars on 183rd, which is the layup in the Bronx. And they actually said, because the cops surround them, they went, there he is, and they pointed me out. I'm like standing there, fucking rat bastards, right? So I had to get out of there, and I didn't know how to get the fuck off there without hitting one of the stations. So was, you know, I remember seeing a truck off the station that I think I could have made the jump. So I was headed for the truck. And as I'm running down the track, a train's coming. So I'm like, fuck, this is a lot of extra shit, right? It's like Indiana Jones shit. So I go, let me find a pole. So I'm looking as I'm running, I'm looking for a pole, because I know this shit ain't floating in the fucking air, this layup, you know? So I see a pole, and it happens to be right be You know where they put the poles? Right between the train track. That rail, that rail. Where else would it go, right? So I'm standing now, running in between the train. Train's coming, and I'm looking for the pole. And he's trying to slow the fuck down, but I'm not giving a fuck. And I find a pole, and I went, and I slipped through. And a hundred pigeons were shooting all over the joint, because that's where they hang out. And then I climbed over and I found the pole and I went down the pole on these little logs, you know, like the rivets. And I went, get the fuck out. I found that. When I found that part to climb out of there and get away, and they're waiting on both stations, I became the fucking master of the layup. Because they didn't know how I got away. I went up the pole, down the pole, up the pole, down. The pole. I kicked ass. I ran all the fucking layups after that. And I found the, and then I went to. I brought every writer that you can imagine and taught them right there. Taught a lot of good guys. And King 2, kicked fucking ass, master. Intricate, his heart went in. Peanut 2, my son. I used to fuck his sister, be with his sister. And I taught him because he had to be around. I had to go to his house later anyway. Peanut 2, King 2, Chicha 133. I used to do their pieces, fill them in. Boom, gone. Did the first whole train with them. We kicked this. The first whole train call was done by us. I did a bicentennial to show America that we love America. It's not anti-America graffiti. It just happens to be kick-ass. We the people, by the people, for the people. The tail don't wag the dog. Dog wags the tail. We run this fucking United States. It's not the fucking politicians. They're just a bunch of ugly actors. Just letting you know that shit, too. It's us. This is the first time our voice been heard, ever that the media didn't cut it off, and they hate us, and that's why they attacked it so fast. This is the first time it's by the, the voice of the people, and that's what I feel like I am, the voice of the fucking person that can't tell what they really feel. So I write it on fucking walls, and they have to read it and look at it and go, that fuck, he said something else again. And that's the best, this is the best way to get like, straight up telling the fucking world what's really going on in the earth. It's a beautiful, and as far as the pieces, it's still growing. I've seen stuff now, it's constantly being moved. It's all, it's reuniformed. It's all been done more or less once before, but it's always different. It's always switching and swirling, and it goes into different levels, and I think it's beautiful. I'm happy to be part of that. Tacky 183, see, it has to do with how you act, too. Tacky 183 ran into Joe 182, story. He said, fuck, them guys are nuts. He was brought up in a, high, a proper, environment, family, mother and father, and that broken home. He would never hang out with Joe 182. Joe 182 kicked ass. Tacky saw those guys, he took off. They were all on drugs. Tacky grew up correctly. He went home, had dinner, did his tag, and went home. He had a different lifestyle. Everybody's lifestyle is different. And as far as him being loud and being a part of that, he couldn't be a part of that. But that's still good. So look, look at his name now. He, As far as his props, you couldn't go... You couldn't give him more props ever. He never, you mean as far as cash? I think he's a multimillionaire. A multimillionaire is when you're happy with your life, brother. It's not about money. I've seen a lot of rich people miserable. And I've seen a lot of poor people happy. It has to do with your soul and how you live. I'm a, I'm a multimillionaire. Look at this. I live people around me all the time. Love, smiling and shit. Say, so you made it? Of course I fucking made it. I'm the richest motherfucker I know. I got my hand, I could draw a picture, I'm hungry, I never starve. And believe me, I never starve. This is the old emergency fucking never starve. You always have to have something that's your gimmick to keep you going. Whatever works, but out of love. Is that on again? 10-4. 
I grew up in Manhattan. I'm from, a, I'm, from a, I'm from like the West Side. My family's like the old West Side Story kind of shit going on. My father was with the Riffs. You saw West Side Story? Well, you're looking at one of the... My mother went to school with George Carlin, man. We're, we're all fucking New York. We have all the criminals and cops, like from um, Murph the Surf that robbed the Star of India to freaking, you name it, the old Eddie Egan dude from Popeye Doyle, French Connection. Those are family members. I mean, it, that was in New York City years ago. My father was a real wild dude. Looked like Archie Bunk and James Cagney. That's his look. So he's singing, boy, the way, what do you hear, what do you say? He's like an old kick your ass kind of style guy, you know? The way I knew who he was and what he did, he would bring home. What he brought home, is that's where he worked, because he used to live in. I grew up in an area where we used to fight the blacks on a regular basis. That's in Harlem. I grew up on 136 in Amsterdam Avenue, in City College. I was in 508 West. And the weekends I spent with my grandparents. My grandfather's Martinez, my grandmother's Sheehan. I'm Irish, Italian, Puerto Rican, my, my mother too. My mother does the Bronx. I used to live near the Bronx Zoo and live near Yankee Stadium. That was my backyard. I used to play with the fucking Yankees on the field. I'd play in the Bronx Zoo with the animals, fight them motherfuckers. I mean, after a good Tarzan movie. And in Manhattan, I lived in this real Spanish Harlem thing where I, I learned a different style. I had rice and beans for breakfast. We sing me, I quiero guando, guando at night. We have to like, all get instruments and shit. My grandfather comes home drunk, it's time to play music, you know what I mean? He's the greatest man in the world. I had a lot of love, going out song from the heart, he always said. And he was, known, he was like a hibado. Hibado was the hillbillies, and those are the real people. They lived on the edge. He had like 13 brothers and sisters. When I went to Puerto Rico, everybody and their mother knew us. But in that area, we used to play like the blacks in baseball. We learned, I learned a lot because we never won for some reason. We were really interested in like the fight. We used to go like about the seventh inning. Tito used to start a fight with the black dudes, which is mad. And he goes, they go, get the fuck out. And he goes, I'm getting my brothers. I'm getting my brothers. He always said that. And they go, get your fucking brothers. And he had 13 brothers. One taller than the next. And that was the end of that. The game, we always won. Because they used to run like a motherfucker. And there was baseball bats and all this, the Puerto Ricans would chase them right back to 145th Street in Amsterdam Avenue. It was a mad thing, and they always came back. It was the sickest shit. I never understood how we were playing them the next week. That was sick. They were sick motherfuckers. And I lived next to Alexander Hamilton's house. That's where I grew up over there. And let me see. It's just living, it was, oh, it was an odd way to live, I'll tell you. I was there when um, they killed um, Malcolm X. I was standing there on a bus stop on 155th. I remember a junkie coming up to me and going, yo, man, you got to get out of here, you're white. I'm like... Wow, this guy's, he would like finish, his, he never finished his sentence. He'd go, yo, man, you got to, and then I'd be like, waiting for the end of the sentence. Then he'd go into, yo, man, let me get out of you, you got to. And we're looking at him, and go, what the fuck? And then he's, finally, at the end of it, like, get out of here. Somebody got killed, Malcolm X. They're going to think you did it. I'm fucking like 10, 8 years old, 9 years old, white, standing on the corner of Trinity Church. So we got to get out of here, but our parents are too cheap to fucking get us on a, a cab. A cab costs a dollar thirty-five for like twenty bucks. We must walk. You must not spend money. You waste a good dollar, even if it's a riot breaking out, motherfucking bottles flying over your head. Make it home. Be good boys. That's knowledge. That's fucking how you survive. You learn how to keep everything that you learn. You keep going. But that was one of my things that I remember as a child. But I was lucky enough to play stickball with like Jackie Robinson. See Mickey Mantle sit in the bar drunk, grabbing bitches' ass. They don't kill him. Put guns to his head, and they go, "Can't kill him. It's Mickey. He's playing the Mardi fighting and shit." Live next to the commissioner of police. I got some mad stories, man. Bernard Carrick was my next door neighbor for a while. Handcuffed me. That's why I wear these. And I have much love for the, the New York City police too. The ones that are real. The ones that say this sucks. There's real cops, there's real crooks, and then everything else is a lot of shit. Well, Edgar Allan Poe live right next to where I live now. I mean, this is Kingsbridge Road, Tracyville, I call it. It's between the four line and the D line. I have, um, by the way, I had um, a piece on every gate. I almost hit two city blocks in a row. First guy to ever do that. Every fucking gate for two city blocks, both sides. I missed it by two gates. That would have been a Gettysburg or War Records for graffiti. 
But um, Edgar Allan Poe lived right there, and he was like the guy that did the dark, that dark fucking like Nevermore and all that stuff, which was pretty wild. And later on, I found out that this guy Bob Kane came to that park in about 1927, played hooky from Clinton, sat there and drew Dracula. And they said, yo, man, that was a bad copy of Dracula, which is wild, because Dracula, he says, that looks like a fucking Batman. And he went, yeah, that's what I call it, Batman. And that's where Batman was invented. So I actually drew this to represent kind of like Batman, because Batman, this is me. Like, I, I always feel like I had that same style of dark, but yet good. I'll save a motherfucker, but I don't give a fuck. I live on the edge. That's where the mask comes in. I always get arrested, but I always get away. But it's the same shit. They put him in chains because they see a mask and they can't understand him, just like they can't understand graffiti, the writers, how we live and how we think. But we're really for all the people and the people that need our help the most. And this is where this is from. This is from my same neighborhood. And Gotham City is where I live. Gotham City is my fucking block. Edgar Allan Poe lived on my block. Batman and Tracy, 160 fucking eight. So you got the three of us, man. I'm the updated version. They're both dead by now. One's living in a, almost like a fantasy. It's, they're both gone, but I'm gonna keep the legacy going on. And after me, there'll be another guy saying, I live near Edgar Allan Poe, Batman, Tracy, and this is who I am. And that's what's gonna happen. It goes on and on, that, that feeling. Like a Tim Burton darkness, dark and light. It's mad, and I'm proud. You know, that's just wild that nobody knows about this. Where I grew up in the Bronx is what that is. A lot of writers you guys um, probably never heard of or did hear of, and they never gave enough understanding. You got AJ, Staff, um, Pro Soul 165, Chi 133. I love you, Cheech. Um, Sunny 107. Which, um, i tell you what they did. I mean, each one had their own style. Checker 170. Kindu was the first guy to come up with an idea to do a bicentennial, which I did with the three guys. Two whole cars. Case and Butch did the other one. Butch is Case's teacher. Butch was a master, by the way. Butch, too, I love you. Case, peace, brother. Um, Kindu was a genius. He was very intelligent, had a high IQ. He looked like he killed his mother and father. He had the face, the black face with the pipe looking beat down. And like, if he was on like uh, the dating game, you would pick that motherfucker, and when he turned, you would faint. But I love him to death. <clears throat> Kindu was smart, and he did that, and, and that showed that we cared about America, like I was saying, it had nothing to do with graffiti, anti-establishment, we loved it. It's just, to, don't tell us how to live unless you're ready to die. For. Um, another shout out to like Pina too. Uh, I got like a million friends, let me see. Jerry Wildstyle, all the guys that died. Jimmy Haha, Khan 161, I love you. Tony Papote, Juan, I mean, Tito, name a million of them. Um, a big shout out to Tacky Demetrius. I'm here to represent you, I love you very much. I don't think you got enough props. That's why I'm, I made this shirt with you, and I'm gonna wear it the whole time I'm anywhere. I'm gonna constantly wear your fucking name. Yeah, Cause they're gonna say, what the fuck is this guy wearing? A real writer, and I'm a real writer wearing it. And I'm proud to say I'm wearing your name. That's good shit. Um, that's what I'm about. I wanna say hello to Mitch77. Mitch, you kicked ass, and you gave up on this shit almost cause you think it's bullshit. I love you, and they know who you are, man. So I'm here telling your name again. Cause you kicked their ass, you showed scene, you saw all these motherfuckers, the bricks, which I started, you know that. No, but you, you showed these motherfuckers a lot of techniques. I want to say hello to T-Kid. T-Kid, you fucking bastard. I'm your father, respect your fucking father. Tracy's kid, no. Let me see what else. Nomad, you're doing good, I'm proud of you. You taught Tats Crew, you know you're my sons. I love you very much. Everybody else that I work with, even like Pink and Crash and Days and those fucks. I love you very much because I work with you. Stitch, rest in peace. I'm sorry you died because you should have fucking not died. I don't think it was right what happened. They let him die and he shouldn't have. You're not supposed to love somebody after they're dead. You're supposed to do it while they're alive, you motherfuckers. Please hear this. If I ever hear anybody goes to a funeral after the person came to the house for help, stay the fuck away from me. That's real life. Um, let me see what else. Be there when they need you, when they're alive, not afterwards. Oh, he's my fucking man. Get the fuck out of your fakes. What else? 
Um, to do the right thing by each other, man. We only got each other. The world's small. Everybody needs each other. Everybody got pain. Don't think you're the only one that suffers. Everybody suffers. But the whole thing, how you take care of it. Whenever I really feel bad, I take it from right here and I go, ha, 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 you motherfuckers. And I laugh like a son of a bitch because you ain't taking that. So always go right down here and take that laugh out of yourself and laugh and give it back and give love. It's good shit. I, I'm lucky God gave me a gift. This is his hand he gave me so I could draw pictures to save, help the earth. I mean, that's why I draw, because this is not my gift, this is my gift. When I get on TV, I talk about all the shit, like take the drugs and guns out of my neighborhood, but the art is my gimmick to get on TV. That's why I'm even here, to say this right now. I love you. peace. How do you are? Tracy 168, Wild Style. I'm your family, who the fuck else am I? Or you could call me dad. Peace. The Bronx. Ooh. Tell me one. Okay, here we go. Years ago, like, there's another thing that I've done that when it reached a certain level, I always felt like graffiti died in 76. So what I did was in 77, I rode on the trains for money. Nobody ever discussed it. I ate with Mayor Beam and Governor Carey. This is me jumping on the train tracks right after I wrote Mayor Beam's name on the train. This is Associated Press. It's the first time world-renowned graffiti became world famous. Got phone calls from all over the world. This is the stunts that we used to do. This is real life. This ain't no fucking um, photo image, you know, moved and blah, 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 all the gimmicks that you can pull today. This is real life. This thing here it happens to be what the lettering that's supposedly called is interlocking letters. That's what it is, called mechanical lettering. It's not wild style, it's wild style based, because wild style invented it. That's me there. This is a piece I did with Riff 170, which is one of the masters. And he kicked ass. Riff 170 was like uh, one of those guys that invented all the styles. And I gave him a nice kick ass here. I love him very much, Pee Wee. He had more names than any writer ever. Mr. Dirt, fucking um, Boy 176, whatever. And here we have a little shout out to the guy that wrote Rapper's Delight, and Tony Tone used to write graffiti with me too. This is Tony Tone. Tony Tone wrote graffiti with me. Much love, Jerry D. Lewis. That's the guy I grew up with. This is um, me sitting in the middle here. This is a photo from um, Andre Torres, the cover for High Times Magazine. This is Grandmaster Kaz. That's Rapper's Delight, C-A-S, da 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 You guys know the story. This is me, so if they think, you know, they always try to hide the fact that I was a part of anything. I guess I wasn't even there. I call this picture Oreo, by the way. I bet you guess you can't guess which side I am. <laughs> Who loves you, baby? Wild Style. This is my family, I love them very much. And let me see. This is important, like anything. See, fucking Bruce here, we grew up with this guy. This guy was a major, everybody and their mother was a martial artist. I used to steal in Chinatown. I still rob Chinatown all the time, so we get into a nice fist fight with a bunch of like martial arts experts. They used to call the ghost shadows. If they got you down there, they'd kill you. But I was into that, like, fuck you, catch me, and if I could get you, I'll stab you with a samurai fucking sword of your own store. Because I was like that kind of style, you know? Ran Shea Stadium with Rusty Staub. Ran Yankee Stadium with Roy White and all those guys. You gotta do all that shit as a writer. Practice the skills of getting away and shit. Uh, let me just end it with a piece. This is a cover I did for um, an intricate piece that I did for Jam Master J. This is Wax Poetics. And this is more or less what kind of piece you have to have running by about 1974. If you didn't have something that equivalent to that level, you was out. It wasn't enough that you could carry your fucking weight on the train, so you had to do something else which was this, go backwards, which was a very bad thing to do. I think that was kind of like crazy. The only time you should do a throw up is when you do an emergency, like kick something, you want to make some damage or make a statement in a bad area. But peace, that's just extra stuff that you can get it in. Boss, oh, that's it. Oh yeah, I'm gonna do a check. This is how the tag is. The most important thing. I did a piece with um, did a piece of T Kid and Scene later in life. 
as a goof, like after one of my benches. <laughs> so they get me up there and they think they're gonna fuck me up. And I did a, I just do colors, like Thundercat colors. And I'm goofing, because no matter what, I'm still Tracy, so you can't beat me, because I'm already there. So what I did was, they did a piece on the left and the right, and all I did was this. And they both went, what the fuck is that? What'd you do there? And I said, I burn you. Because no matter what, the tag is so fucking powerful. First beat the tag, then you were talking about pieces. The tag is more famous than I am. How the fuck can I beat that? This isn't even on Welcome Back fucking Carter on the door. Who loves you, baby? That's the end.